I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company, Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Don't forget to head on over to our website, shamelesssex.com, for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to your favorite podcast in the whole wide world, Shameless Sex. <laughs> Coming at you two days a week. Woo-hoo. And on Instagram Live on Fridays at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Sometimes we're giving away free stuff. You never know. So get on there. Come check us out. It's true. This is true. Your dog That's is adorable, April. Just got a haircut looking cute. He's a prancy little fucker. I'll tell you that much. I know. During he the prances days. around, he's kind of a dick but you know what's really funny is that you were talking about how your hair isn't going to be able to be done during quarantine but your dog's hair goes done (laughs) i know i know he looks good well he needed his i don't i can't cut his nails because i get too freaked out i'll hurt him and he also uh, can't see out of his eyes when the hair gets long (laughs) yeah and they were taking dogs you just you can't go in there when another customer is so it's like six feet away so i was totally stoked that they were still accepting their their clients so he the did clients. get the dog clients. their clients yeah that's adorable i know i was on a zoom call today and he was attacking my a business zoom call and he was attacking my arm biting me oh. and i was like this is embarrassing my animal's currently chewing a dog bone behind me and uh he is stoked right now i'm so grateful for having animals right now oh my god what a blessing um let's dive into the podcast though this podcast we recorded ages ago. <laughs> I know. When did we record this? Like in January? I think it was sometime in January or early February. It was before the viral, the virus stuff. Um, it was before, it was you and, you and I were still in person recording, I think. Uh, I believe it was a long time ago. So um, those were the days. Amy. Those, those, were, those the were, days. were the days. Now we're far, but you and I were going for a bike ride soon, six feet away. It's going to be adorable. <laughs> six feet. Six, six feet. feet. So this is with Rachel Kramer Bussell, not Bussell, as I said in the podcast, Bussell. Uh, she writes erotica and she's an editor and a writer for erotica. Um, and I, as you all know, I co-own Pure Pleasure Shop with my mom, purepleasureshop.com. Uh, and we used to have a retail store and now we're all online and we sold her books. So I've always known of her, um, known her name. Um, and by the way, purepleasureshop.com is still open and our listeners get 15% off with coupon code SHAMELESSSEX. We probably have some of Rachel's books on there if should you be interested after you listen. Um, but we have all kinds of other sex toys. So we are going to dive into the podcast, but first we have a really fun testimonial, a sex question that I'm sure a lot of folks can relate to about kissing. And then we'll dive in. April, what's our testimonial for the day? Amy and April are the best humans ever. <laughs> just kidding. I just added that. We're really fluffing ourselves up today, aren't we? We need it. We need it today. <laughs> Seriously, I do. I've been on edge. I'm so crazy. I need to get outside, Amy. It's, so It's not that pretty outside. I, mean, I don't know if you want to go out there right now. Stay inside. I know. It's sad. And by the way, to our listeners, we do love receiving your words of praise. So thank you for those of you that write us questions and that send us beautiful messages and words. Thank you. So here we go. All right. You pretty much saved my bedroom life with the wifey. I would say sex was good before, but something happened that made me start to analyze our relationship in relation to sex. I did some soul searching, studying, and also found your podcast. Hearing two women talk so open and freely was really an eye opener for me. I had accidentally put my wife on this angelic pedestal, thinking that when I came to sex, Thinking that when it came to sex, she was the holier-than-thou type of woman. Well, that was unbelievably wrong and unfair to her. She's a woman with all the complex feelings, needs, and desires that every other woman has. I've learned so much in the last few weeks and will continue to be a student of the game. Since then, our sex life has absolutely exploded. 
We're doing things that we used to do and also things we've never done. It's been amazing. I have literally fell in love with her all over again. She's so sexy and hot with three exclamation points. I know your podcast helped so much. So thank you again for all of your knowledge and willingness to teach and be open. Also, Uber Lube rocks. Wifey approves. Aww, that's cute. <laughs> that's, that's adorable. adorable. I love hearing when people who have been together, by the way, I did I, oh no, actually, I don't see that, think they said how long they were together, but you know, they're married and there's this idea of who their wife was. And all of a sudden they just had this like reframe, these re- reprogramming. And now they're like, she's a fucking sex goddess. <laughs> it's just like, it just, it makes me so happy inside to see. I like it. He's, or they said that, uh, she was on a uh, angelic pedestal that he accidentally put her there. I don't know if this person is what gender. However, they put like we'll just say they put her there. So I think I think he. I, I'm pretty sure I remember the the name, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But yeah, okay. that, that holier than that, which is so it's common, like the Madonna horror thing, right? There's like this, you know, this idea that they're either like, you know, the Virgin Mary mother, or they're like the slutty, you know, slutty sex partner person. And there's like this confusing thing. Um, and especially with pregnancy and having children that, that shifts how one might perceive their partner. And this is just an, a great example of what can happen when you have a, just a complete reframe. You learn some things, you try some new things, you reframe your programming of how you think and bam, hot fucking sex. You're married and you're probably having hotter sex than a lot of uh, people who are new relations are. So good for you and keep rocking that Uber loop because you know we love Way it. Way to go. Insert applaud here. Woohoo! Are you ready for a sex question? Yeah. I'm 40 and my wife is 45 and we've been together for 18 years this past February. When we have sex, it ranges from amazing to epic, even now after all these years. When we touch, no matter how innocent it is, I start to get aroused. She loves sex too, but she's always in her head. My main concern is our kissing habits. I love kissing her. If it were up to me, I make out with her for a few minutes every time we part. For her, when we kiss like that, she says it makes her want to have sex. And that's not where she's focused on at this point in time. For me, I'm like, that's the point. I kiss you to show you I want you. What's the matter with that thought lingering in your lover's mind until you meet again? It's like stoking the fire, as you all so eloquently put it in one of your podcasts. Couples need that to keep the burner warm, right? How do I convince her of that? It's to the point where it's put to the point now where it's odd making out with her even when we're intimate. So in this, this, this person, um, I'm pretty sure identifies as, um, as a man, male, um, he is essentially saying that he wants more kissing. He loves it. And it doesn't have to, to lead to sex. It doesn't have to mean sex is, I guess is what I'm gauging. Um, it's something that just like, yeah, there's a turn on that goes there, but it doesn't have to mean one thing and that they really enjoy it and love it as a connection with their partner and their partner has decided that it means sex and they don't like that feeling in their body of, ah, now I'm turned on and, and now we have to have sex, but I don't want to. So let's not even go down that road at all. And so now they're at this, um, this, like this miss with each other. Oh my God. Is there your animal? Hey animal, how you doing? Uh, sorry. He, he agrees. He's just, Leggy's like more kissing, more kissing. Woohoo. Hi buddy. Nice to see you. Um, which I think is really common. And I think more so we hear this oftentimes from female identified folks. And I like that this is an example that uh, regardless of gender, a lot of folks experience this where they have a desire for more intimacy, more foreplay, more connection that doesn't necessarily have to mean sex. And and kissing itself can be such a powerful way for people to feel that. So the question is here, uh, how do, well, first of all, couples need that to keep the burner warm, right? Yes. I think couples often do, especially in long-term relationships. I think couples need kissing and foreplay and things uh, to keep the intimacy going and that burner kind of continuing to, to flame, the flame to, to shine bright. How do you convince her of this? Okay, I want to get away from convincing anyone or making anyone feel. It's not, you're not selling them on anything, right? Um, it's more so, in my opinion, you don't convince her to change and do something. You share how this feels for you. So you're not saying like, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z because that's what you should do. It's more so, hey, 
Like I love kissing. Here's what it feels like for me. And what and kissing doesn't have to lead to goals. It just feels amazing to connect with you and to share that with you. And it's actually really important to me. It, it creates this feeling of, I don't know, how, whatever it feels for you, aliveness, connection, juiciness. I like that feeling of um, us kissing and then being turned on for a little bit, not knowing when I'm going to see you next or what will even happen later. Um, and it, and I don't need it to be goal-oriented. Um I understand how you feel about it, but I'm wondering if maybe we can work together so that we can both have our needs met. So less convincing of her to feel a certain way, more you sharing just what this feels like for you and does for you and how important it is. And then asking her, you know, what her experience is and how you two can meet each other in the middle because it is important to you. April, you love kissing and desire more kissing in your life. I love, yeah, it's true. And I think, it's not as important for my partner. So when I, I've kind of explained to him like, hey, in order for me to start getting aroused, if we're in an intimate setting or we're getting, you know, it's sexy time, uh, I, I kind of call in more kissing. And when it comes to our day to day, it's not something that really, he doesn't really go to that. Like that's not his thing. So I think that, for me, it's not like make or break and I don't need it all the time. It is a requirement for me to actually get turned on. So if this, his partner saying in our, um, our sex question asker here that she feels like she gets turned on. So perhaps it's just something like, okay, it's really important to me, but I understand that maybe it's not time for you. So I accept that as long as we still get to tap into that when we're getting ready for our, our nightly kind of epic sex sessions as, as he put it, amazing to epic sex sessions. And that's sort of like a a compromise or meeting in the middle and also understanding what she wants. And I like what you said about the whole convincing aspect of it, not necessarily being a, a good, a good thing to try to tap into convincing anyone of anything, right? It's kind of, maybe it'll shift for her eventually. You never, you never can predict how people will change or shift. So I think kind of compromising for the, for the time being. And then if it, for, for the person that asked the question, if that's something that is really important to you and you prefer making out at all times, whenever you see each other and you're kissing, maybe bring that up in a way that is in a, in a gentle, in a gentle asking inquiry, in a gentle inquiry. Okay. Just yeah, let her know that. And I think it's, it doesn't sound like anything in this entire question is, is a, a concern, right? It's not like concerning, like, oh man, that's some serious stuff you have to work through. It sounds like you have all the elements of really incredible relationships. So this little aspect, it's, it, I think it's a, an, an easy fix. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's. And it, this sounds like there is a lot of really great connection and sex and and touch. And, and as April's saying, it, everything is a negotiation. Uh, relation, any relationship we have with anyone, whether it's business, a friend, a lover, we're constantly negotiating. What are your needs? What are mine? How do we meet each other? And it doesn't have to be one way. We don't just figure out. All right, here's the perfect formula of how we always meet each other. It changes day by day. So, it, like April said, it could be like, okay, well. Maybe we just make sure we make out before we have sex or maybe, but we still find sometimes where we also, I get my need to just have that with you when it doesn't lead to sex too. And so just opening the door for sharing feelings um, and making a, some open the door for a negotiation, to figure out how do you both meet each other. And, and continue focusing on all the good stuff that you have. You have a lot of gold here that is really, really great. And I think that's, that's what I, I would I would do. It's easy and, to focus on the stuff that you, that bothers you. I think that that's in life and, and in relationships, you're like, Oh, that's, we were just talking of the person that was on our podcast yesterday, the pocket podcast hasn't come out yet. It was, it was uh, mentioned, it was about making great relationships and it's, it does, it gets easy to nitpick, right. And focus on the bad stuff. And sometimes you forget about all of the, the really, really juicy, good stuff too. But I also think that there are valid needs that that shift in long-term relationships that that are 
worthy of confronting, or worthy of speaking to. That doesn't mean that you're just focusing on the bad. It just is like, oh no, this is becoming a really big thing for me that maybe was once here and now it's not, or maybe it never was, but I'm all of a sudden really desiring it. And so I, I think that it, it is still a val- it's a valid, it's a valid need. I think when you have some big touch need um, there that you're really craving um, to, to speak to. So um, ask for it and see what happens. Get creative. Oh, yes, it is. And I like this. I, I, it's been so long since we've recorded. I don't remember exactly everything we talked about. I'm excited to listen to the podcast again, but I remember she did read some erotica. So stay tuned. It's, it's juicy. great. So Rachel Kramer Bustle is a writer, editor, event organizer, and writing instructor and consultant. She's edited over 60 anthologies, including Come Again, Sex Toy Erotica, The Big Book of Orgasms, Spanked, Red Cheeked Erotica, and five volumes of the Best Woman's Erotica of the Year series. Rachel's nonfiction writing has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Oh, the the Oprah Magazine, Self, Elle, Rolling Stone, and elsewhere. She teaches in-person erotic writing workshops across the country, as well as consulting. I almost said counseling, but consulting via eroticawriting101.com and an upcoming online erotic writing class. To learn more, visit Rachel Kramer Bustle. I'm going to spell it out for you. It's R-A-C-H-E-L-K-R-A-M-E-R-B-U-S-S-E-L.com. But first... I want to tell you a little bit about something from our beloved sponsors. We love Dipsy. You've heard us talk about Dipsy before. Our listeners love Dipsy. My clients love Dipsy in my sex and relationship coaching practice. Why do you ask? A lot of folks are having a hard time feeling their desire or they just want to spice things up. And we are... uh, creative folks who like newness. We like hearing new stories, seeing new things. And Dipsy created this app where you can listen to these super hot erotic stories that can get you in the mood either for yourself or if with your lover or partner at any time, anywhere you want to. It's sexy. April, you listen to Dipsy. What you think? I like putting on some Dipsy stories when I'm cleaning the house. These days I'm in the house all the time. So I'm listening in my headphones. So it's kind of a secret. It's my own little secret and I get turned on and sometimes I just go and masturbate in the bathroom. It's epic. So if you and your isolation want a little dipsy action too, or just when you're home, you want to check it out, go to this little thing called the Dipsy app. You can download it where all the apps are found and shameless sex listeners get 30 days free. You just go to dipsystories.com slash shameless and you get 30 days free, y'all. That's D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash shameless. I'm going to say it one more time for you because I really want you to check it out. Dipsystories.com slash shameless. All right, let's get back to the show. All right, everyone, it is interview time. We are here with Rachel Kramer Bussell and not Bussell, as I was trying to say before. Um, Fun fact, so a lot of our listeners know um, uh, my mom and I own purepleasureshop.com now, but we used to own the retail store, Pure Pleasure, where we actually sold a lot of Rachel's erotica books. Um, So I've known who Rachel is for a while, not personally known Rachel, but um, so it's exciting to have you reach out, Rachel actually reach out to us to come to our show. So this is exciting. I was like, I know who this person is. I have been aroused by the erotica that she's chosen. <laughs> That's hot. Yeah. Isn't that a fun I've thing? I've been aroused to, by your like, erotica. Isn't, yeah. I mean, we cool. know, like, well, I wonder how many people are having or- orgasms and thinking about us, but like you're giving people orgasms too over there. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> That's what comes out of your brain. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Yeah. What an honor. Eloquent erotica. Will you so start by telling our listeners how you got to be where you are today in this world of sexuality? It's a little funny how I got into erotica because I had never written fiction before. I had always written, but nonfiction. And I was reading a lot of erotica. This is a little over 20 years ago. I was in college and then law school. That law school did not work out. But um, I, And I saw a call for writing about celebrities, so celebrity fantasies. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try this. I've been reading a lot of it. I 
I wrote a story about Monica Lewinsky. It was called very imaginatively Monica and me. (laughs) And it was basically about a character who's almost exactly like me, who has a fling with Monica and that got published in 2000. And I've pretty much been writing erotica ever since. And then a few years after that, I got asked to co-edit an anthology and then edit some more of my own. And now I, I do more editing than writing, but I pretty much work with erotica in some form every day. Oh, wow. What, and that, that's a, that's a fun, that's a pretty fun gig to have to, to be in the world of erotica. It's pretty exciting. And I think for me, not that I don't want to continue writing erotica, I do occasionally, but I don't have new ideas all the time for myself. But I'm always curious about what other people are cooking up in their brains. So doing what I do and getting to edit stories by people from all over the world is really exciting. And some of them are just starting out like I was way back when. So that's cool because they're very excited. Sometimes it's their first published story and other ones are, you know, maybe they write um, romance or they write something else entirely. And this is a diversion for them. Uh, And it's just very cool to get to kind of see where one theme emerges out of one theme emerges so many different takes on it. And many that I could never conjure up, even if I sat at my computer all day. Um, you know, people write about everything from mermaids to, in my new book, there's an aerialist story. And I, I almost don't even understand all the logistics because I don't know how to do aerialist performances, but the author does. So it's really exciting. And I think it makes me a better writer to be an editor and, and vice versa. So I have a question because I know that a lot of times books in general are becoming less and less of a a thing that people actually own, right? They have their their audibles or so and or in the it, the area of, of our lifetimes of all of us listening here where media is our computers, our phones. So video porn is everywhere, right? So my kind of question is, because erotica is an art and it's beautiful when you read or have it read to you. Um, there is such a gorgeous art about it, the voice and, and what's happening. I, it gets me so turned on. I love it so much more. Um, and some people are totally unfamiliar with this. They just can only get off from seeing porn, the, the old in out, in out, or whatever they're into, right? I don't, whatever that looks like. So what can of erotica uh, inspire literary erotica? I don't want to pit, you know, visual porn movies against written erotica because I think, you know, some people like both, some like one or the other. But I think one thing the written word of erotica can do that is less likely to happen when you're watching porn is that you can visualize yourself in the scene or visualize someone else with you with those characters and and I think it kind of is, it unlocks people's imaginations, mm-hmm. which porn might also do, but in that case, you have a clear image. You know, it, it, I think it's more challenging to do that. I think with erotica, people might think, oh, that could be me, or I could write something like that, or what happens next after the story ends. And I, I especially, I think a lot of couples read it together, people, people tell me, uh, and it, that especially can they can feed off each other like they might start reading a story and then you know continue it in what they would have wanted to happen or talk about what would I do in that situation you know would I go for something totally crazy or would I you know be more shy about it you know and I think you can read erotica and there's really not pressure to to live it out unless you want to live it out. But, you know, so a couple, maybe they're interested in exhibitionism or, and or voyeurism and they might read about someone going to a sex party. Now that could be a precursor to them discussing going to their own sex party, or it could just be to get turned on. You know, I read about, about a lot of things that I think are hot in erotica. I don't necessarily want to try them at home, but I might get very aroused reading about someone else doing them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, that's kind of a, a space for our sexuality that is either private if we're reading alone or communal if we're reading with someone, but it's, it's kind of about fantasy and imagination and just enjoying the words versus 
images per se, or, or the images that pop into your head. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of people do listen to audio erotica, audio books or other forms, and, you know, you could replay it over and over just as you could savor a particular passage. You know, I'm sure some people read certain parts of erotica over and over and maybe skip over other parts and that's okay too. Like that the same way you would with porn, like that's fine. There's no right or wrong way to approach it. How, how does, so how would you say, well, I guess there's there's two questions. One, so how do you as an editor choose, like what makes good erotica, right? Or like maybe good's not the word, but like, how do you choose the erotica that goes in these, um, these books, these or anthologies, if that's the right terminology for what you're doing. And then also how do people, how do individuals choose the right erotica for them? Those are good questions. How, <laughs> how, how I choose for my books, I mean, it's partly sometimes I read a story and I just know this story I need to publish, like that one about the aerialists, because I've been doing this for 20 or so years and I've never read a story about that. So I just knew, okay, if I haven't read that, then other people haven't read that. It's so creative and unique. The other thing I, I really look for is variety because I don't want people to get bored, even if they're reading all stories about bondage. I have a couple books about that or spanking or some specific topic. I don't want them to just feel like, oh, I know what's going to come next, even though you know there's going to be bondage or spanking. I still want them to have a little bit of a surprise element and want to keep reading. So, you know, like uh, one of my books has a mermaid sex story and I got another mermaid sex story. Both were very well written, very interesting, but I didn't put them both in because I wanted to opt for something else that was different. Now, in some cases, I might use that other story down the road another time. Um, I think for people looking for erotica for themselves, I mean, there's two ways you could go about it. You could say, okay, I'm into spanking. I'm going to read a book of all about spanking. I think for other people, sometimes they don't necessarily know I'm into X or Y, or they think they're into this, but they want it, their minds to kind of be opened, or maybe they don't know they want that, but they could appreciate that. And I think that's where erotica anthologies can come in because there is a lot of variety. You, you don't, you're not going to spend, you know, 10 hours reading one story like you would maybe a novel and then feel like, oh, I didn't like that. You can skip around and it only takes you a few minutes to read each one. And then if you're curious, you know, you can maybe find something else by that author. Or if all of a sudden you're like, wow, mermaid sex is super hot. You could go searching for longer works of mermaid erotica. But I think it's an easy way to to enter it because, you're not committed to, oh, I'm 300 pages in and now I want to know what happens next, but I'm not sure if I'm turned on. You know what I mean? Like you'll know pretty soon whether you're into it or not. Is mermaid sex only in the water? <laughs> are they having sex in, in the rocks? Yeah, they, are they? They, are, <laughs> they are having sex uh, <laughs> Let me check it out. in I'm trying like, to ask you this question. What, what, see, that's when I personally probably would not have written because I would I would have been too nervous about getting all the details wrong. But um, but I think this one was very interesting because it's kind of a, a culture clash story because it's about a woman and a mermaid. And, the, you know, she's not sure what's happening or what's going to happen. And, you know, they can't really speak in, in the same language. So they're communicating with their bodies. So I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on there. And I think stories like that are, are interesting because, you know, you're not going to live that out in real life because a mermaid does not actually exist. So what? I, I, think, I think people are interested in the kinds of sex both that could really happen. Like, yeah. oh, you know, maybe I would be going about my day and something wild happened and as well as the ones that could not actually happen but but we they occupy our minds like they do um intrigue us mm-hmm. it's the little mermaid 2.0 i know yeah it's <laughs> yeah a little Ariel, little mermaid no. triple x getting spanked with her fins <laughs> oh, no. getting spanked with his fins did he become a merman no. Oh no, she became a human. I think yeah, she human. It's been too long oh, wait. since I've oh, seen Oh wait, it. I don't remember. No, she became oh, a human. I... Anyway, princesses and princes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I loved what you said. A piece from my um, my first question to you about 
when folks like couples could read each other. I love that so much because it is in your partner's voice and you can switch off reading, which I think is such a great idea as well. Uh, so I guess my, my next question is about incorporating erotica into your sex lives. You mentioned you could act out the the things. Of course, there's no rules, right? Anyone can do whatever they want. Uh, But I was wondering if you have any suggestions about how couples can just incorporate erotica in their sex lives. I think it can be a really great way to not necessarily spring something new on someone, but just try something new in the bedroom that is less uh, maybe intimidating than if you not that you shouldn't try, you can't try sex toys too, but you know, let's say you want to try spanking, for instance, instead of busting out a paddle and being like, you know, I want to use this on you or vice versa, which someone might all of a sudden find a little just not surprising and not know what to say in the moment. You could start by reading erotica about spanking and then, you know, leaving space to talk about like who, who did, who were you more intrigued by in the story or what did you think of that? Or would you ever want to do that? I think it can, because it's fiction and it's not, you know, an essay, which is, or, or nonfiction, which is just more serious by its nature. The whole point of it is to be arousing. I think you can, each person can kind of they can be together, but also letting their own personal imaginations go and then, and then figure out, okay, what is our common ground? Like, do we both want to be spanked? Do we both want to spank someone? Do we, do we both want to try both things? And I think because uh, the written word can, you can incorporate both the physical actions and the emotional side of it. You can really learn about, okay, it's not just that someone's hand is hitting someone's bottom or whatever they're using. It's, and it felt like this physically and mentally because the, you can't really assume, okay, I know what that spanking is like for that person or character just because I've done it. Um, it's it's going to be different to some degree for everyone because we're all individual, unique people. So what might turn me on about a spanking might be different for another person and another person and another person. And I think erotica gives space to explore all those different reasons why someone might want to be spanked. It's like a deeper understanding of your partner without having to pry things or have like this intense communication with each other. You can pick out your own erotica. I love that idea. And And you could also take the time, you know, you don't have to figure out whether you want to try it immediately after reading the erotica. You can let it percolate, you know, and maybe you read a few pages a night and then read some more the next day and kind of draw it out and, and, you know, maybe discuss it in between. Um, And I think erotica can, I think especially like I edit a series called best women's erotica of the year, but I know a lot of men read it. And I think a lot of times they're reading it in order to kind of get a sense of, okay, this is what turns women on. I mean, I'm not saying it's what turns every woman on or that it's supposed to be comprehensive, but a little snapshot of this is what is arousing to some women. And I think it can give insight into other, other genders, other types of sexuality. I mean, maybe your partner has told you they're really into some fetish or act and you don't know what to what to think about it. Like you're not turned off by it. You're not necessarily turned on. You just are sort of clueless about it. I think erotica can be one way to kind of get into the mindset of someone who's into that and without having to act, I mean, yes, talk about it with your partner, but you can give you another set of uh, feelings about what that's like without putting pressure on the partner to answer, you know, every question. Cause if they're just curious about it, they might not know everything about what it's like. They just might know, okay, I'm intrigued by this, or I want to try this, but I don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, and erotica can offer one example of what might happen if people try this. And I really try to include both single people who are hooking up with someone and couples in my books, because of course there's drama when you first meet someone and there's tension of what are we going to do? You know, do they like me? Do they want to do this with me? But I think couples also have, you know, an ongoing erotic conversation between each other over time. And that's something I think is important to explore in erotica too, because I think 
we don't we don't talk about that as much as we talk about the initial hookups, you know. Well, and one thing that came to mind for me too is we get a lot of questions from people in partnerships who are wondering how do they keep things new and spicy and exciting. And um, and so it sounds like what one is just reading the erotica can be really exciting, but another one is uh, the ideas that it can give you to keep things fresh. Oh, well, you know, because that's hard for a lot of people. Like, how do I come up with creative ideas and things that we can try? Um, that are outside of the norm and so that you can get all these different creative ideas. I mean, and that's, that keeps things spicy. That keeps the newness. And the other thing that I thought about was about how uh, the 50 shades of gray thing, when that came out and how many people got inspired by that, you know, there's a lot of criticism about it as well, but people like, Oh, I'm going to try some Kegel balls because there was a Kegel ball scene where she had an orgasm five seconds from Kegel balls, which isn't how it normally works. Um, the Kegel balls and spanking. And I want to try flogging and all these things. And soccer moms, like yeah, oh, yeah, m- or people like that yeah. normally wouldn't buy erotica, yeah. And I think, sort of like with that example, I mean, a lot of I I don't necessarily think Fifty Shades was the best written book, no. but I think it did open up space for people to just be thinking about these things or learning about them. Like I think a lot of people didn't know that all of those sex toys and the concepts of BDSM necessarily existed, and I think from my impressions of meeting people who were fans of it, a lot of what it did is, you know, these women were carving out space for themselves to say, this is my time away from my kids, sometimes away from a husband or partner just to enjoy myself. And then the repercussions of that were that they, you know, could maybe approach sex a little bit differently or think about it a little differently or try new toys. And you know, erotica is not a manual, so you don't have to do the exact thing that they do in the, in a book. You can, you can do it your own way. You know, you can, you can try something or, or even just, you know, go to a sex toy store or look at sex toys online. Like you don't have to, just even that can be something partners can do together and discuss, you know, would I like to try this? You know, would I, what would I do with this? And I think erotica can be a way to sort of walk through that with a fictional example of it. You know, maybe like I'm intrigued by nipple clamps, but are they going to hurt? Or, you know, what is it like? And you can kind of see characters interacting with sex toys in a way that, you know, might help kind of ease your concerns if you, if you have, if you have those. Okay. Time for a quick break. This podcast is made possible by OMGS.com. OMGS is a research-based online program that teaches you all about how to pleasure the pussy. OMGS studied thousands of vulva owners to find out how they orgasm and then made tasteful and inspiring short videos to show you techniques on how to pleasure yourself or another vulva. I've been recommending OMGS to my clients for years and has changed their lives. So for all you vulva owners or vulva lovers out there who may already be having good orgasms and you want to take it to the next level, or perhaps you want to explore more variety in your playtime, OMGS will have something just for you. With two seasons, one all about internal and the other all about external techniques, it's better than any book or DVD money can buy. To learn more, visit omgs.com backslash shameless. Our listeners get $5 off. Check it out. This podcast was also made possible by Uber Lube. It's a luxurious silicone lubricant great for all kinds of sex. It's less likely to throw off the pH than most other lubes. And there are hundreds of doctors who recommend Uber Lube to their patients, whether they want to make their hot sex even hotter or for folks who are experiencing dryness. You never knew lube could be this good. So whether you're an avid lube lover or you've never used lube before, Uber Lube is right for you. It has no flavor, no scent, and feels absolutely amazing on the body. Uber Lube has endless uses. I use it to tame my hair frizzies, to prevent chafing, and I even put some in my mouth right before an oral sex session, and it totally ups my blowjob game. Oh, and the bottle, it's gorgeous. It's totally discreet and looks more like a beautiful cosmetic product, so you can even leave it on your nightstand shamelessly. To learn why we think it's the best lube on the planet, check out uberlube.com. Use code SHAMELESSSEX and you get 10% off and free shipping. That's uberlube.com. Go check it out. And now back to the show. My question is about people that want to write erotica. Obviously, you don't have to be 
an avid writer, I'm sure even folks out there listening have their own ideas. So do you have any tips or advice for people that want to be an erotic writer? Maybe. I think one of the coolest, uh, I think one of the coolest parts of erotica is that you don't need a degree. You don't need to have written anything before. You just need your imagination. A lot of people start out sort of like I did writing about things that they personally fantasize about or that they've done. And I think that's a great place to start. You know, some people want to talk about in erotica, their own personal life. And some people want to go the opposite direction and not, you know, reveal anything personal, but, but think about, okay, what if I was, you know, what if I lived on Mars or I'm a woman? What if I was a man or whatever? Um, you, you can do any and all of those things. And, one of the great things is you have the internet at your disposal. So you can look at photos for inspiration. You can look at news stories. You can look at, you know, how to articles, if you want to know something super specific, or you can even look at forums where people are talking about, like, I'm turned on by this. And, and I mean, don't steal someone's words, word for word, but you can get ideas um, about how to, you know, massage the, the initial, um, plot line that you've had. And really you can put anything in erotica. You can put, you know, orgies. You could also put like a funeral because both of those things, I mean, people aren't having sex at a funeral probably. Someone but, has. <laughs> but but you know, people do have sex not only when their life is going amazingly well. They also have sex when, you know, they're going through challenging times. And that can also be part of erotica if that's what you want to write. I've written erotica that people have told me made them cry, which is not, you know, that's probably not the direction most people want to go. And I wouldn't necessarily say write a whole book of super sad erotica because that might make people too sad. But, um, but, you know, you can incorporate all of life's many different activities and emotions into erotic moments and because, you know, we're still sexual beings, no matter what else is going on in our lives. So, you know, I, I think one great way to just get ideas is to like eavesdrop on conversations and, you know, maybe a snippet. You don't need to, you know, take exactly what someone is saying and, you know, that's your assignment, but you might hear just like a phrase and are like, oh, that phrase is sexy. Um, there's a phrase, I think this is from football, and I think it was a TV show. I don't actually know what it means, but necessary roughness. It was a TV oh, show, or yes. I think, and, and I don't actually know what it means, but I just loved that phrase because I thought, oh, how kinky is that? Like, mm -hmm. what does that mean? How can I take that and make it into a story? So sometimes I just start with words and I, and I work from there. Or sometimes I start with, my friend told me about going to Paris and seeing this woman who was eating French fries with a fork on a plate with like a burner underneath. And it was so sexy to me. Like, I don't think of French fries generally as a sexy food. There was something, I, I love French fries, but I, I don't eat them in a really sexy way, but that intrigued me. So I wrote a story about a woman who sees a woman doing that and goes in and they share French fries and more. So, you know, just talking to people about things that they might not be telling you a story that they think is erotic, but it might spark something for you. And, I, and so I think really you could look for inspiration, TV, the newspaper, your neighborhood, your coffee shop or the grocery store. Um, you can really turn any moment of your life or someone else's life into something that is erotic because I think what makes it sexy is sort of what I was saying before. It's the motivation of the person. Like I don't find every time I go to the grocery store, it to be an erotic experience, but it could be like, there was one time I dressed up in a sexy outfit and I was with my boyfriend and like people were checking me out. Cause I looked a lot different from most of the people shopping. And there was a kind of sexual element to it because we were both kind of like, Oh, like people might hit on me if I wasn't with you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can use everyday life, experiences and give them sort of a, a supercharged erotic element that maybe you wish would happen or even if you don't wish it would happen in your fictional world you wish it would happen amy made me a taco before we started recording <laughs> and i want to know how you can eat a taco sexy because mm, that just brought up okay. something for me i was 
I want to know if anyone out there can write erotica about eating sexy tacos. April it's shoved actual, it in her mouth. She's like, I'm ah, gonna, I, I got to eat quick. I got to eat quick. It's just everywhere. So, I mean, that could be hot. Well, well yeah. I mean, it. Could, I think it could. Maybe, like, you. Ha- there's a reason you have to eat it in a hurry. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not great at, like, on the spot. But I don't know. <laughs> that, but this that's not a test, me. by the way. I just. <laughs> or, or maybe I'm a feeder. And with a feeding Ooh. fetish, and I watch you shove in your mouth, and I get so turned on See, that so I just. <laughs> I love this. There you go. I have to have Creating you now. Creating erotica out of situations that that just that gave me such a uh, creative insight into myself. Just you talking about the French fry eating woman and thinking about that taco, and now you feeding it. I love that. And I love like it can also use it when you're in a frustrating situation, like you're online at the. I don't know, post office or you're stuck in traffic. Like I, oh, I don't drive. So maybe this is less relevant to people who actually get stuck in traffic. But whenever I give this assignment to students, I think, oh, well, wouldn't it be sexy if you're stuck in like wall to wall traffic, but then someone gets out of their car and then you get out of your car and you start flirting and, you know, you know that the traffic is going to just crawl. So you have time to be like, kinky or sexy I was in LA, or whatever. I think they were going to beat me up because there's road rage every day. <laughs> Depends on the city. However, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. But that is sexy. Yeah. Some hot. But you could make anything. Or, or, or a broken down car or um, one time I wrote about this woman who was setting fires in her house so that like sexy firemen could come <laughs> over. Did but I had to do firefighter? I didn't, I didn't want her to like burn down the whole house because that would ruin the mood. So she had to set small fires, like a microwave fire or like a little, like something that, you know, would require help, but wouldn't. Damn, it happened again. <laughs> like, excuse me, ma'am. We're, we were over here last week. You, it's happened again. Um, Some taxi cab erotica. Yeah. Ooh. So do you think um, right, pra- people practicing riding erotica can help them to learn how to, to, to do dirty slash sexy talk? I mean, that's an obstacle for a lot of people. By the, the practice of riding it out, can it help you act to actually vocalize it? Yeah, I think it can. I mean, I think one of the biggest notes I give to authors is I say, but how did it feel for them? Because I think a lot of times the impulse is to describe the physical action, like, you know, her leg was here and her leg, her mouth was here or, you know, whatever the physical thing is, but we don't always know as a reader what they're feeling about it or both how it felt physically and like what they're thinking, because you can't assume just because, you know, you could be at an orgy and someone could be bored, you know, you can't assume, oh, it's sexy just by the nature of what you're writing about. You have to describe why it's sexy to that person in that moment you know is it sexy because this is their long lost love is it sexy because it's a total stranger is it sexy because i don't know there's really an infinite number of reasons why some particular moment could be hot for them and i think dirty talk or just any talk really like even like you said earlier when the person reading it is you know, they have, they're your lover. So they have that voice that turns you on. Sometimes it could just be them saying your name or just saying one word. Like maybe a couple has like a, the opposite of a safe word, like a go word where they're at a party and one of them says that word and it's like, oh, be lying to the closet and banana hammock. Get, banana hammock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and so, I mean, no one else would have to know that banana hammock, whatever, you know what I mean? So Stop. I think that, I think like inside secrets between couples can also be really hot because it means something to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean something to other people who might be around. So that's kind of working on two levels. Would you be willing to read something on the air for our listeners right now? I Maybe would. they're driving and they're looking around in traffic and they are going to listen to you read some erotica and someone will get out of the car and start washing their window. <laughs> <laughs> and then they- with it while you find what you what you will read. I can't wait. <laughs> I am gonna read a little bit of that aerialist story I mentioned Ooh. earlier. It's called Spin by Lauren Emily, and you can read the whole thing in Best Women's Erotica of the Year, Volume Five. And it is about two women who are in the middle of doing an aerialist performance. Spinning is tricky business. Some aerialists can't handle it at all. Motion sickness leaving them heaving into the Rosen bucket, sipping water or frantically chewing ginger candy to settle their stomachs. You're always going faster than it looks to your audience. And when you're suspended up above with only one mat on the ground that'll hardly cushion the blow if you fall, the stakes are high and they are scary. 
Me, I love spinning from day one. I get off on the risk, the looming crash of brain and body. If I don't concentrate on the fabric, take deep breaths, just plain enjoy the ride, I'm toast, as I've learned the hard way after wiping out, slamming my shoulder into hard ground one too many times, or staggering out of the fabric begging for mercy. But when I catch the moment, spin just right, find that sweet spot of chaos and control, there's no greater high. You shift forward just slightly, and your ice cream tits sink into my back. I grip the fabric above me even harder, my arch starting to cramp, but I'm intoxicated from your lips brushing the nape of my neck, where an errant strand has escaped from my shellac top knot. I know from the way the sling pulls, the audience's ooze, the unobtrusive flash of the camera down below, that you're extending your leg behind you, a flawless arabesque like you learned in Parisian Ballet Conservatory with Monsieur Renard years and years before we met. Better to distract everyone from your fingers playing lower and lower as my clit hardens, ignoring three layers of thong, thick tights, and iridescent dance trunks. I bite my lip at the hedonism of it all. You like, you whisper, as the tenor vocalist on the glass track sounds a round O in harmony with my own. When you nip my earlobe, my panties become soaked, but the performer in me wants to milk this moment for all it's worth. I grab the fabric with my extended arm and flip out, dangling above the ground with only one elbow hooked in the fabric to the crowd's delight. We're going full on improv, and I can already tell I'm a hair's breadth from having an orgasm in the air. Your mouth is an O of surprise, like you didn't know I had it in me. Ha, two can play this spin. Should I keep going? Oh, I love it. You gotta leave them hanging. You gotta leave them I hanging. Like literally. Wow, literally. Literally. Oh, not, that, that I, was a pun. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I love that. I love the just the creativity. Uh, and then I, I got the visualization of like these the like, textures and sensations. And I know that it's unique for everyone what they'll they'll take from it. But I definitely you know felt that. I forgot exactly what was said. Like you know, oh, feeling your ice cream tits. And like, it was also like fun. The, <laughs> yeah, and, and there fun, was yeah. some quirky side things that I don't even know about for aerial performances and the artists that do those things that yeah like and I think what I was saying before about like how to find the erotica you want um I'm not just saying this because it's self-serving but I think what's cool about an anthology where there's different sexualities is you might you know your sexuality might be one thing but you can still be turned on by reading about people who are different from you and you know, that doesn't mean you're, you know, if if you're a woman and you're straight, you can still be turned on by reading about two women together. And, and because the, it's, it's really about the writing. Like I've been turned on by reading about things in erotica that don't turn me on in real life because the story sucked me in and it was so compelling that I just wanted to know, okay, what's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. So how can people buy your work and so you're you're you have stuff things that you've written but also you're an editor of all these uh, different books like how can people find your work you can find me at rachelkramerbustle.com and there's links to my books uh bwe of the year.com is where you can find about about best women's erotica of the year and all of the books are available in print ebook and audiobook and you can sample those online so you can figure out uh you know, which ones you want to buy. Some, some have all different sexualities. I've done a book of bisexual erotica and spanking bondage, basically not everything, but a little bit of everything, Mm -hmm. (laughs) almost everything. I love that. There's Mm -hmm. so many options to explore. So things can always be spicy in everyone's relationship. I think erotica is, it's my new porn trying to take another porn break anyway. So <laughs> erotica is lovely and it's, it, it does have this masterful feeling to it and the writing is beautiful. So what well, it also reminds me when we did the interview with um, Dr. Nan Weiss and yeah. she's talking about news. She said, she's like, don't watch the news, read the news because you watch it. It's, it's, it's shifted. It's altered. You know, it's bi- there's a bias there, but when you read it, you get to make you, know, and that's, I mean, of course it can still be biased in print too, but there's more room for you to make it your story, you know, with your imagination. Um, so we're not shaming people people out of, you know, watching the news or porn. And I think there's just more room for uh, individuality and creativity um, within your experience when you read it. 
So and if you are, can I say one quick no, thing? Of if course you are a do. fan of porn, Joanna Angel has a story in Best Women's Erotic of the Year, Volume 5, that is basically a true erotic story with a few tweaks she made, but it's called One Last Gang Bang. Uh, <laughs> I love that. That one is a lot of fun, so... One last gang. One last chip. gang. Gang. I was just going to encourage and invite our listeners to grab a glass of wine, Margins Wine. Oh yeah. And curl up with your favorite erotica, either by Rachel Kramer Bustle or one of the folks that she edits for or with, I should say, and uh, yeah, enjoy yourself and try something new. If you've never read erotica or had someone read it to you, I think that's such. I love this episode. I I want to write erotica just for you, Amy, about taco eating. Yeah. Did you say marginswine.com? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm about to. So okay. <laughs> if you have never checked out marginswine.com, go ahead, do it. Sign up for the newsletter. She does two releases a year of boutique, small batch wines that won't disappoint. We love them and we love all of you. Yes. And Rachel, we love you too. And when April writes her taco erotica, she'll send it to you, Rachel. You guys do. <laughs> for editing. It might need some help. So, but I will, I will send it. So thank you for your time and all the info yeah. and sharing your gifts with the world and with us. Thank you. Ironically, I'm having tacos for dinner tonight. Oh, perfect. Now you're going to look at them differently. You'll be like, oh, mm. how can I save this oh, taco? Juices get all over. I love the salsa. All right, y'all. Thank you for being part of our shameless sex revolution. You are amazing. We'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.